Hello everybody and welcome back to a lecture series. I'm Ted, your host, and for this lecture we're going to continue right along with our look at uh, political leaders, African American political leaders in the latter half of the 20th century. And uh, in, uh, in our last lecture we looked at uh, the careers of t uh, Tom Bradley in Los Angeles and of course Andrew Young in Detroit. We sort of compared and contrast uh, the two men um, uh, Young sort of rode the uh, black majority of Detroit into office. Um, his administration was dogged by uh, not really a lot of scandals, but just by his heavy-handed uh, his heavy-handed tactics in terms of governance and uh, what many view as his mismanagement of the city. Um, as uh, had Detroit sort of um, attempted to uh, regain its composure after the riots of 1967. Uh, white flight, um, which contributed to a, a drop in the uh, uh, the tax base for the city of Detroit. Um, we also uh, we also noted that he had some great accomplishments. Mainly, he persuaded the great auto manufacturers not to abandon Detroit and relocate elsewhere, keeping those jobs in the city. Um, but uh, but but he himself was uh, forced. Um, uh, really by ill health to, uh, out of office and we, uh, we also looked at the career of uh, Tom Bradley of Los Angeles and we sort of compared and contrasted them uh, much as we had uh, done earlier in our course when we examined Jefferson and Hamilton um, Bradley uh, rose to power um, not so much on the strength of the African-American community because Los Angeles then and now um, uh, has a very large and overwhelming European American population, uh, and it also has a very large uh, Hispanic minority. So he could not rely solely on the vote of the African American community. He had to build a consensus among various community groups. Uh, Bradley was noted for his conservative attitudes and his conservative pro-business approach to city governance. Uh, that being said, he did. Uh, oversee the increase uh, in the role uh, and opportunity for women and uh, ethnic minorities in the city governance of Los Angeles and that it wasn't so much any scandal uh, personal scandal that brought Bradley down it was the uh, the uh, the history it was his it was his response to the conduct of police officers during the Rodney King beating and his response to the beating of Rodney King in general that sort of uh, uh, that, that that was sort of his undoing, as well as his inability to uh, placate or uh, console passions, uh, to sort of um, uh, to, uh, snuff out the uh, the flames of uh, of anger that uh, erupted that 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 erupted in the uh, destruction of the uh, of the riots following Rodney King's uh, uh, following the Rodney King verdict. Um, and from there, we'll continue on with our look at um, at African American politicians, prominent African uh, African American politicians. We'll look at Marion Barry. Uh, the Marion Barry was uh, another prominent mayor uh, during the African American mayor during the latter half of the 20th century. Um, during uh, during for the majority of the latter half of the 20th century, Marion Barry was the mayor of the nation's capital. He was the mayor of Washington, D.C. He was the mayor of the uh, District of Columbia. Barry had a far more checkered past than most of his contemporaries. Uh, he was born into poverty uh, in the Jim Crow Southeast. Uh, he was a member, uh, he was the first member of a family to attend college, to, to gain a college education. Um, while at a, a state college, while, while, while in college, he began to involve himself with the student movements. Um, notably in, in Nashville, where he organized sit-ins and other nonviolent protests. And in 1965, Barry relocated to Washington, D.C., where he helped to organize student youth groups uh, and a political coalition of residents fighting for home rule from Congress. Uh, Barry was elected to the City Council of Washington, D.C. in 1974 and then mayor of Washington, D.C. in 1978. Uh, with support from Afri from the African American community and from liberal okay. European Americans. Now, Barry was great at organizing and grassroots uh, community organizations, but he was a terrible municipal administrator. 
and the city fell very quickly on financial hardships not long into his mayoralty. Uh, his, mayoralty. Uh, his professional shortcomings were were his uh, were were, uh, were not his un undoing. However, the, it was his personal shortcomings, his personal controversies. Uh, uh, to sort of um, highlight them, Ronald Reagan had been able to escape unscathed from the uh, person from his personal shortcomings, from the personal scandals of his administration and of his cabinet. Barry was not able to escape from uh, the flames unscathed from his personal shortcomings. In 1990, Marion Barry was caught on camera, he was filmed on camera, smoking crack cocaine in a local Washington area motel with uh, women. I I'm not sure if these women were prostitutes or, or just um, uh, some sort of uh, women that he just um, colluded with, not, not colluded, but he just associated with them. I'm not very sure of the women themselves. Um, but we are definitely sure that it was him. And, uh, and the, uh, the Rodney King videotaping and the uh, Marion Barry videotaping uh, sort of go to uh, highlight the rise of candid footage of, of filming people uh, in, in public uh, and then also in private and then broadcasting them to, uh, the, wide, to the, the larger audience of the world. You can sort of think of them as world star moments. Um, if, if, if you are familiar with the uh, world star hip hop um, uh, network or uh, I think it's a website. It's a website or an app. Um, uh, if, you're if you're familiar with that concept or even get the concept of making uh, videos and releasing videos online like I'm doing, uh, um, then you can sort of see the parallel. You can sort of see the evolution of, uh, of average people doing that and then becoming famous for it. Um, you can also look at the Depruder film of the assassination of President Kennedy um, has uh, had to sort of mark of uh, capturing these very public moments and, uh, and having these very public moments um, become enshrined in the national consciousness. Uh, so Barry, caught on camera smoking crack cocaine in a Washington area motel. He was subsequently removed from office and jailed. In a remarkable twist, six months after his release from jail, Barry staged a political comeback, very much reminiscent of the comeback staged by uh, Dick Nixon. Um, where he once again won a seat on the city council of Washington, D.C. And less than a year later, in 1994, he won, uh, he, re he was re-elected to the mayoralty after a much publicized religious redemption campaign in which he appealed to voters on the grounds that while he was incarcerated, he uh, experienced a religious awakening. Uh, that, that he was uh, a born-again Christian. Um, continued fiscal hardships led Congress to reassert control over Washington, D.C.'s municipal finances, and voters uh, then turned him out of office once again. Um, so, uh, in many ways, it's, it really does sort of mirror the, uh, the political rebirth of Richard Nixon, you could say that Dick Nixon's political rebirth, his political comeback, and uh, Marion Barry's political rebirth, political recomeback, mirrored each other, has did their eventual political collapses. Um, Harold Washington of Chicago, a very another uh, another prominent African American mayor, and David Dinkins in New York, also prominent African American mayors. They uh, they um, they have very brief tenures. But it was much publicized and it sort of highlighted the opening of opportunities and the building of coalitions uh, to bring them into office. And their coalitions really sort of mirror and stand in contrast. We really mirror the coalition that David Bradley had to build up. And they stand in contrast to the coalitions that, uh, or the uh, voting base, support base, that Marion Barry and Andrew Young stood on uh, had, had they began their uh there, um, at they uh, took political office. Um, we can look, uh, we, we can look and see that Harold Washington, um, in Chicago, he had been a lifelong Democrat with an illustrious career in Illinois politics, um, uh, that, that included 10 years 
in the state legislature and of course the United States Congress. Um, he was a congressman before he won the mayoralty of Chicago in 1983. Now, Washington was left-leaning and he was very blunt in his speech and in his approach and he very quickly uh, moved to reorganize Chicago city government, making it more diverse, more uh, enigmatic and more um, uh, and more inclusive. He brought in more ethnic minorities and more women into uh, city contracting and uh, and uh, into city management. He, he he addressed issues that had largely been overlooked during the uh, the tenure of uh, of uh, Richard Daly. Um, the longtime city boss of Chicago, um, he made it more, more, more diverse. Uh, Washington was a very uh, successful and a very resourceful politician, and many looked at him as having a very bright future ahead of him. However, Washington, uh, he tragically, um, his life and his career were cut short when he died of an, uh, a heart attack. Uh, he died uh, in 1987 while still in office of a heart attack. And of course, uh, David Dinkins, uh, two years after Wash uh, Harold Washington's death, after Washington's death in 1989, David Dinkins won uh, office as the mayor of uh, New York City. Now, David Dinkins was another longtime Democrat um, uh, with a long career um, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, politics in the city of New York. Um, he had been a, a longtime member of the city uh, count of uh, city government in New York, and he won election uh, as the mayor based on his uh, dignified, civil manner. Um, now, Dinkin was accused by his opponents of being both indecisive and uh, and, of, and of exercising poor management, uh, especially in the wake of uh, multiple racial controversies under his watch, most notably the, uh, the racially charged incident of the Central Park Five in which uh, five African American young men were accused of having sexually assaulted a European American female. Um, most notably there was a, uh, a full page ad taken out by then uh, city New York City businessman, now United States President Donald Trump, in which he advocated um, executing these men who, in addition to being innocent of these charges, uh, had not been found guilty by a jury, had not even been arraigned uh, on charges at this point. Um, but Dinkins, uh, he lost his re-election bid in 1993 um, and, and it was largely on the strength of his inability to, uh, to manage uh, racial, um, those racial controversies. Now, throughout the history, of the, of the United States, um, the National Legislature, Congress, had been comprised primarily of European American males. Uh, of the more than 1,100 representatives who have served since 1789, less than 160 have been African American. Uh, the history of African Americans in Congress is typically divided into four waves. Uh, the first, of course, beginning in 1969 during Reconstruction. Uh, when Joseph Rainey, a former slave, won election to the United States House of Representatives. Uh, and he, he won election from South Carolina. And uh, we also look at the election of Hiram Revels. And, uh, and both of these men were covered during Reconstruction, but they, but they, uh, they, they note and they, and they bear um, the discussion. They, they bear to be mentioned again. They, they're noteworthy enough to be mentioned again. Uh, Hiram Revels, he won election... Uh, to the Senate from Mississippi um, during uh, during during the same time during, during that same election cycle. Now the second wave uh, of African American politicians at the national level begins in 1980, uh, 1877. Sorry, uh, begins in eighteen seventy seven with the election of Rutherford B Hayes and of course the abandonment of state reconstruction. Uh, the third wave begins in 1928 with the election of Oscar the Priest of Illinois. Uh, and of course, the fourth wave begins in 1970. Uh, the 1928 uh, election of Oscar uh, the Priest um, sort, of, sort of heralds uh, in or, or focuses in on the Great Migration. You had this great mass movement of African Americans into these uh, northeastern and midwestern and Pacific Coast 
cities and they began to look for uh, they began to advocate and to nominate themselves, members of their own community, to represent them at the municipal, at the state, and of course at the federal level. Uh, and of course the, uh, the fourth wave, the wave since 1970, um, was largely the product of uh, largely the product of the mid-19th century civil rights movement, uh, most notably the uh, ratification and the passing of the um, Voting Rights Act, and of course the, uh, the newfound confidence that many African Americans had in, uh, in, partic in uh, participating in politics and in uh, having a say at local, state, and national governance. Now, uh, during Reconstruction, a total of 22 African-American men were elected, were elected to serve in Congress, 20 of them in the House of Representatives and two of them in the Senate. Um, with the corrupt bargain uh, or great compromise, has his, uh, those, those are two names that of the two names that are used to refer to this event in 1877. Um, the end of Reconstruction occurred. And, a, and that number dwindled to a handful until 1901 when George White of North Carolina left office. Um, between 1901 and 1929, no African American was, a, was a, a member of the national legislature. That would not end until Oscar the Priest's election in 1928 um, and it's it taking office in 1929. Um, no African American served in Congress. Uh, from the uh, old slave states due to the dis voter disenfranchisement laws. So uh, the grandfather clauses, uh, the explicit uh, banning of African-American voting, and of course poll taxes. Uh, they all prohibited African-American involvement in, in voting. Uh, and of course uh, low population densities in the free states also, uh, in, the former, in, in the former free states, also uh, precluded African American political participation because uh, they could vote, but they could not vote for members of their community to represent their their specific interests like like other communities could. Um, during the same time period, we saw uh, Swedes, Irish, ethnic Irish, ethnic Italians, uh, ethnic Germans um, elected to uh, the federal legislature to advocate and to. Uh, um, proposed legislation that would benefit their communities, um, not not the same for the African American community. Um, now, uh, the third wave, the third wave that followed the pre election was a significant change to all of that. Um, African American voting uh, voting patterns and demographics would uh, would change um, as more and more African Americans move to these northeastern, midwestern, and uh, and uh, and west coast cities, they changed the demographics of those cities, and they brought enough African Americans to those cities to where the community could exercise um, a political voice, to where they could send in uh, members of their own community to uh, to advocate on their behalf. Uh, the priest like um, Oscar the Priest, like his congressional predecessors, were Republican. Um, now beginning with, uh, with uh, the Priest's immediate successor, um, Arthur Mitchell, um, the rest of the politicians of the uh, African American politicians of the 20th century will be Democrats. Uh, and then this would uh, be uh, a sort of noted change in uh, in, uh, in voting patterns for for African American communities, uh, not not all of them, but most of them, there certainly were very prominent Republican African American politicians uh, who were pro civil rights during the mid uh, and late twentieth century, um, and even into the twenty first century, there are still prominent Republican African American politicians in the national legislature, but the vast majority of them would be Democratic uh, politicians. Uh, career Democratic politicians. Um, uh, the, the new urban centers in Illinois, Michigan, New York, Pennsylvania, Missouri, Ohio, and California 
um, the, these, these centers that African Americans flocked to during the Great Migration would see the uh, would, would see the propulsion um, of the early political leaders. Um, and one leader um, who, uh, who rose to office uh, fairly quickly on the heels of the Great Migration uh, was Adam Clayton Powell. Uh, Adam Clayton Powell was an African American congressman uh, of the third wave uh, who is best known, um, uh, who, who really is, uh, is best known as being a contemporary of uh, John Conyers. Um, uh, Powell was a, a contemporary in terms of riding that, uh, riding that third wave into office. Um, and, and writing the uh, the population shift that the Great Migration uh, brought into play into office, much like John Conyers had. Um, now uh, Powell, uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., was a was the son of a local minister who had served on the New York City Council before winning his congressional seat in 1945. Now Powell's career is noted for a number of reasons. One, he was an outspoken critic of racial segregation and discrimination who used the prestige of his office to challenge them both. Um, he carried himself with great dignity uh, and, and he really used himself in his position and the fact that he was an African American politician, articulate and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and and uh, so forth to to really compound uh, to really compound the the arguments raised against African Americans uh, at the time. Now um, Powell was also the uh, the first African American to chair a major congressional committee. He chaired the committee on uh, education and labor. Um, Powell was also instrumental uh, in passing Medicare. Medicaid and of course the Head Start programs of the 1960s. Now Powell was plagued by scandals in the 1960s and he was denied his seat uh, in, in, uh, in the House of Representatives by his fellow representatives but he was able to regain his seat by appealing um, that, uh, that denial to the United States Supreme Court. Um, but Powell had been weakened by scandal and he lost his seat in 1970 to Charles Rangel. Um, and, and Charles Rangel has represented Harlem uh, uh, up, until, uh, up until the very present, up until uh, 2016. Now, uh, it should be noted that Adam Clayton Powell sort of rose, uh, rode the, uh, the wave of settlement into Harlem during the Great Migration to gain a seat on the city on uh, New York City Council and later uh, gain a seat in the United States Congress uh, and uh, of course um, Charles Rangel has maintained that seat maintaining his hold on the uh, African-American population on the descendants of uh, those who moved to Harlem during the Great Migration um, now with the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the uh, call for black power, a number of African Americans made their way to the to Congress, um, and, and the number of African Americans uh, in uh, in political life across the Republic rose significantly. Uh, the third wave of African American political activity witnessed the arrival of the first African American women to Congress, um, notably going back to Shirley Chisholm, and she's another New Yorker like uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Um, she, uh, she from Brooklyn. He from Harlem. Uh, she went. To, she uh, went to Congress representing Brooklyn in 1968. Um, she was followed by Barbara Jordan of Houston and uh, Yvonne Burke of Los Angeles, who both won elections in 1972 and took their seats in 1973. Now, in 1971. Nine African American Congresspersons established the Congressional Black Caucus, the C, uh, CBC, and used the uh, and, and they and they used uh, this at their tagline, at their official motto: um, "Black people have no permanent friends, no permanent allies, just permanent interests." Has a guiding point, has a motto and a guiding uh, philosophy for. For policies that they will support and uh, and, and sponsor, um, 
the CBC is uh, gave itself and, and it still maintains several missions, um, notably to push for more African American representation in Congress, uh, to fight for more power for black representatives in Congress, uh, and of course to sponsor and support legislation of importance to African Americans generally. Now the CBC has endured its fair share of controversy. Uh, it has been labeled by liberal African Americans uh, and, and conservative African Americans as too racially divisive. Um, uh, conservative African Americans and conservative groups call the group too liberal. Uh, and really a number of liberal African Americans uh, labeled that group too conservative so that this sort of um, you know damned if you do damned if you don't can't really please anybody uh, and that in that regards and of course it's racially divisive to uh, liberal European Americans racially divisive to conservative European Americans but the CBC has survived and thrived um, and, and it had an immediate impact after its founding after its founding those original nine members presented President Nixon with a list of, of, of over 60 foreign and domestic policy recommendations for his administration. Um, with that, we shall break here. Uh, hit like, subscribe, and comment. To let me know what you thought about this lecture. And we will come back with a, another uh, lecture. We will continue on with our discussion of African Americans after 1970. As always, I am Ted. Hit like subscribe and comment. Let me know what you thought about this lecture.